Welcome to Lecture 4, Dynamics of a Particle, uh, continued. This is MEC 4428, Advanced Dynamics. Until today, we've talked about the basics, of the, basically an introduction lecture. We've talked about having the, about the kinematics of a single particle, how to describe it uh, moving around. We've talked about dynamics of a single particle, how it moves due to forces applied on it. So the dynamics, in a sense, is just been used with the kinematics and together. And we've also talked about um, energy methods. And really, we've just only had a start on energy methods. There's really not much more than that that we've discussed. And we've talked about uh, Newton's second law in detail. And what I mean by that is we've talked about uh, free free body diagrams. We've talked about uh, vectors. We talked about a variety of things and all associated with, uh, with Newton's second law. We've looked at how to solve the equations of motion for forces dependent on position, velocity, and time. And most importantly with this is the uh, chain rule. Uh, chain rule trick, if you remember. All right. And we spoke a moment on the possibility that the mass might be changing, the velocity might be very high, and so forth. And at the end of the day, uh, what was important is that uh, some of the forces is equal to the time derivative of the momentum. Notice these are vector quantities again. And that might be m dot v plus m v dot, where the dots again are the time derivative terms. Most systems, at least uh, most systems that you might actually think about really looking at, are more than one particle. They interact with each other and they interact with the environment. When they interact within each other, that's called an internal force, and when in, they interact with the environment, those are called external forces. And yeah, that might be obvious, but the distinction is important later on. Their motion can be along vector directions, and when they are along particular vector directions, we talk about having linear momentum. In other words, you know, the linear momentum P, which is just mv, and that v is a vector, and that's the direction that we're talking about when we speak with regard to momentum. Or we can have ve vectors about a point. So maybe we have linear momentum about some particular point B, say. And this thing we say when we're saying about implies that we're going to be talking about angular momentum as opposed to linear momentum. And that distinction is important and we'll talk more about it today as well. Furthermore, B might be moving. In probably the first year through the third year uh, courses, when you talk about uh, maybe uh, angular momentum, rotation, torque, and all of that, point B that we're speaking about is, is never moving. In here, it definitely will be in some time, in some cases. Might be wondering, well, how do we handle all this? That's what the goal of today's lecture is. First, let's talk about momentum of a particle and the impulse. When you talk about linear momentum and impulse, and they, of course, the linear momentum is just p is a function, p is equal to mass times velocity uh, for constant for a constant mass, and that's mass times r dot, where r is the position vector. And then we know the Newton's second law is the sum of the forces. We can just represent that as just a cap F, say, on a particular particle. The sum of the forces on that particular particle over I is equal to the time derivative of the momentum, or P dot. Right? And we integrate both sides with respect to time from T1 to T2, say. We look at, uh, we're looking at one time and then some other time. Integrate that. Integrate what the applied force is over that time. And we look at integrating the the change of momentum in time, and using uh, the second law of calculus, uh, then we end up with uh, p is the momentum we have at the second moment, t2, minus the momentum we had originally at t1, or p2 minus p1, if we just abbreviate that, is equal to this integral from t1 to t2 of the sum of the applied forces over time t. So we'll define the impulse then as f hat, notice the hat here, 
Ooh, sorry about my handwriting. Jeez. The hat here. All right. F hat is equal to T1 to integration and from T1 to T2 of the supplied force over time. Sum or integration of the force over a period of time. And then you use a sum whenever you have discrete uh, time periods. Things to note. Impulses are most definitely not forces. Okay, the force is integrated over time. Impulses have a unit of force time, and the change in the particle's momentum from T1 to T2 equals the applied impulse. No more, no less. If your momentum is P, which is equal to MV at T1 and T2, then your impulse then is just equal to the mass times that change of velocity. This is especially uh, popular to use in, say, orbital calculations for, like, spacecraft when you're transferring between orbits. So you, anybody who's interested, take a look at Hohmann transfer. If you Google for Hohmann transfer, you can learn a lot more about this particular topic. Okay, so that's linear momentum and impulse. Easy enough. You've seen that stuff before, I'm sure. But angular momentum is um, just, just an extension of that. And that's the point of this. So we know the sum of the force is equal to the time derivative of the momentum already. And suppose we try to find the angular momentum of this particle about b. Assuming that b might be moving at some cons constant velocity, v sub b. So our momentum arm, then let me draw a picture. We have maybe b here, all right, and then we have point p, and that's our particle right here, and it has some sort of momentum as shown here. Okay, so there's a momentum, and it's changing because we have applied forces on this on this direction. The momentum is changing directions over time. It's going a different direction. From B to P, well, that momentum arm, we'll call it, or moment arm sometimes it's called, we'll call that rho. This point B itself might be moving at a velocity V to B. By Newton's second law, then, if we take and use the cross product with rho on both sides, all right, using the cross product with rho on both sides, as and rho is a vector here, then it's rho cross f on the left-hand side, rho cross the time derivative of the momentum p on the right-hand side. So here's a very dim image of what's going on. We have our fixed coordinate system. We have O, X, Y, Z. And then we have a vector uh, to our point B. B is here. And this is R sub B and the, with a velocity V sub B. And we have a, a vector from B to our point P here that's rho. And we have applied forces and the momentum of this point P. And furthermore, it has a mass m as well. So now, if we take the time derivative of both sides, if we take, take a look at this, we can actually tease out some information about this particular term, and we're going to do this kind of backwards. All right. So let's take a look first at the time derivative of this whole thing. We've got rho cross p in here, but let's take the time derivative of it. So we have time derivative of rho, the moment arm, cross with the, the linear momentum p is equal to d rho dt cross p plus rho cross d rho dp dt, I should say. So if we group for the term, collect on the term that we're looking for, right, rho cross dp dt, then we have this part is equal to the whole thing minus the other part. This rho cross dp dt is equal to time derivative of rho cross p minus d rho dt cross p. We can say, so what? Well, if we look at it a little closer, rho cross f, well, that's rho cross dp dt. Well, as we just, just derived, this part is equal to the whole thing minus the other part. And if we start looking at what we've got in these terms, we can start to actually get rid of some of this. Now the, the vector from the origin of the fixed coordinate system to point P is R. That's equal to the vector to point B. So let me draw a picture of it here. So we got from the origin, 
there's the origin O, and then we've got point P out here, and we've got point B down here. We can either go straight to point P, and that's R, or we can go through point B. So that's vector RB, and then we've got out here to rho. Have that all. So from here to here is R sub B, from B to P is as rho. Add those two together, you get R. Take the time derivative. Take the time derivative of that, and that's that's R dot is equal to P, the velocity of point P. It's equal to R B dot plus rho dot, or in other words, V B plus plus rho dot. Our first equation then, if we start looking at what we've got then this r dot, we can, we can use that as well as we can use rho dot. Rho cross f, that's from over here, rho cross f is equal to time derivative of rho cross p minus d rho dt, this, this is rho dot, okay, and so this rho dot here is actually equal to v minus vb. So it's the velocity of point p minus the velocity of point b from here and here. So what we've done is we've just substituted that in, substituted that in. So we have got d dt rho cross p, that's the whole thing, minus the other part, which is equal to what we had before, rho cross dp dt, that's minus v, minus vb cross rho. Now, rho cross f then, this time derivative of rho cross p minus this quantity, v minus vb cross p, right? And if we if we take out this minus sign here, we've got v cross rho minus v b cross rho. So we've just regrouped, and v cross p. Well, this v this p is equal to m v, isn't it? That's going to be v cross p is equal to v cross m v, and that's m v cross v. Anything cross producted with itself is equal to zero, and so this term goes away. We're left with the first term and the second term only. So rho cross f, that's equal to the time derivative of rho cross p plus vb cross p. What is all this? Well, this term is our torque. Essentially just the applied force on the particle about point b, or we might say it's a torque. And then this is the rate change in time of the angular momentum, the right, this linear momentum, when you have an, a moment arm cross producted with the linear momentum, that's angular momentum. Take the time derivative of it, that's rate change in time of that angular momentum. So this part is sort of like our, our acceleration, our angular acceleration. This term, this last term though, doesn't show up in the linear momentum part. The reason is, is because B might might be moving, and so this represents a correction for that particular term. Okay. If we define then the moment of the force F applied about B, notice that we've got the subscript here. All right. And that's the moment about b. If we pick a different point, say the origin of the fixed coordinate system, we'd have to write m sub o, the two different values. So it's important to remember that we need to subscript. m sub b is defined as rho cross f, rho is the moment arm, f is the sum of the applied forces on that particular particle. h sub b is rho cross p, well that's the angular momentum of mass m about b. Okay. We also say that uh, m sub b, then we call that the moment, Sometimes they call it the torque. Sometimes it's written with a capital T. Sometimes it's written with a tau. But we always have that subscript B in there. If B is not moving, then V sub B is equal to zero. Okay. And so then the moment, the torque, whatever, is equal to the time derivative of H sub B. So the, this is like Newton's second law. about a particular point, B. Okay, so it's like Newton's second law about a particular point. Now, this time derivative of H sub B, well, we know it's rho cross P. 
And if if the point B is moving, then we have to worry about the moment arm changing, the moment arm length changing, and we also have to worry about the rate change in time of the momentum. So we've got the time derivative of, of this angular momentum. Well, that's really rho cross P. The linear momentum is P. The time derivative there is is on the first term, cross product with the, the linear momentum plus the moment arm cross product with the time derivative of the linear momentum. This p dot, the rho dot I should say, remember the rho dot is actually v minus vb, we just derived that on the last page, cross rho, cross p I should say, plus rho cross mr double dot. This is the linear acceleration. If v is not moving, then the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to rho cross mr double dot. Our rho isn't changing length. Let's take a look at an example. Given the body moving about point O, say, and it will say that this is governed by central forces. And what we're looking for is H naught, the angular momentum of the body about O. For a solution here, We're going to first look at a picture. What we have is we have a mass M here that's moving around um, a, a point O. And when they say central forces, the forces point at the center. Right? So all these forces always point at a particular center. In this, particular, in this case, the center is O. So the forces always point at the center, and we're going to say that the, this particular mass, this is moving around, has forces applied to it that point directly at O, and the distance of mass M from O, we'll call that distance capital R. And furthermore, we're going to define the um, coordinate system. We'll say that along the, the path that this particle is traveling, we'll call that E theta, and then, of course, in the radial direction, we'll call that E sub R. Okay. So the central force implies that the force is on the body is pointing at a single point in space always. All right. And using polar or cylindrical coordinates, we'll say that this this fixed origin O um, from from that point O out to the mass M. Well, that vector is R is cap R E sub lower, little r. Our moment about F moment of f about zero is about o is actually zero. So we have to applied forces. Remember that our moment is equal to rho cross the sum of the forces. In this case, the only forces that we have is this f that's pointing towards o itself. And our rho is actually r. That's our moment arm. And our force, again, is f. And our r, well, that's capital R e sub r, crossed with minus f e sub r, right? Because the f is pointing inwards against e sub r. Notice that e sub r cross e sub r is basically what we're going to have. That's going to be equal to zero. So r e sub r cross minus f e sub r is going to be equal to zero. We don't. We have a zero moment for this. So in this case, our moment about o is equal to the time derivative of the angular momentum. Notice that o is fixed. So what that means is that our V sub O for our correction term, that V sub O is just equal to zero. So we don't have to worry about any kind of a correction term here. And so the time derivative of the angular momentum is equal to zero because this is this M sub zero is, is zero. And so our angular momentum, if we integrate once, then is going to be equal to a constant. This idea, when the, the applied moments about a particular point, say O here in this case, is equal to zero, and so that our angular momentum is a constant, that's called the principle of conservation of angular momentum. You also have a similar situation when you talk about linear momentum. The linear momentum case, of course, is when there is no forces being applied to a body, then it, it tends to travel without change. So a similar sort of idea. We just have a particular point that we've picked here. Now, h of 0 is equal to a constant, so that means that rho cross p 
or r cross b is equal to a constant as well. Right? That's the definition of our angular momentum. And so then h naught is equal to m times r cross r dot. Because our p goes to linear momentum, that's m r dot. This is actually the exact version of Kepler's second law. And if you know your any astronomy at all, you know that Kepler had three laws, and he came around before uh, Galileo did, and discovered that that in fact you could describe the mass of a body that was going around the sun, for example, by figuring out how much what the distance from the sun was to the body, and then cross in that with the the amount. Of, of change of that particular vector divided by the amount of time that it took with an extra 2 in here. So let me show you what I'm talking about. That particular value is equal to a constant. So what Kepler actually found was that this area here marked out by a body as it's traveling around say a, a a central, f a central object like the Earth around the Sun or, or Jupiter around the Sun always remains constant. So if the body comes closer towards the Sun, it actually moves much quicker so that this area always, re always remains constant. If it's much farther away, then it actually moves much slower again so that the area always remains constant. That's Kepler's second law. A mass will sweep out equal areas over an equal amount of time in an orbit. And when we're talking about central forces, usually what we're talking about is something associated with orbital mechanics. Okay. So this is the idea. Areas here are the same. We go from T1 to T1 plus uh, delta T, and T2 to T1 plus delta T. Delta T here is the same. We go from here to here, and from here to here in the same amount of time. Although the distance traveled is much farther over here on the left because it's actually closer, much closer to the object. And you've seen this sort of stuff on some of these bad science fiction movies where when you have a, a satellite that comes in very close, it actually accelerates very rapidly. When it moves out, it go, travels very slowly. And as it comes back in, it moves very quickly and so forth. Important things to remember about this is don't forget that you have Newton's second law that you can use. Whenever you're working on angular uh, momentum problems and angular acceleration problems, you always have Newton's second law that you can rely upon. You also have impulse here that you can use. We didn't really talk about it, but uh, we'll show you an example later on. And then you have angular momentum, which is just basically Newton's second law about a point that you've picked. And we have that the, the moment about the particular point that you picked, now m sub b, say, is equal to the time derivative of h sub b, that, where h sub b is the angular momentum if b is not moving. And then we have this correction term if b is moving. And the angular momentum is rho cross p, where p is the linear momentum, and rho is the moment arm. And then we have the moment or the torque, which is rho cross f, as f is some of the forces on the body. Finally, we have work, kinetic energy, and potential energy. Don't forget that either. And as well, we have uh, if the applied force is conservative, the sum of the kinetic and potential energy is equal to a constant. And as well, you can check about the conservative nature of things uh, by integrating f dot dr over uh, a closed path. The angular impulse is the integration of a moment over time as well. It just works exactly the same as linear impulse. Uh, we just have to define point B, and and it works exactly the same. So note this equation as well. So we're done with single particle. Now we'll continue with talking about uh, multiple particles.